and welcome everyone. We've got a great Funder Focus session planned for today on a really important topic. The incredibly concerning spikes that we've seen in chronic absenteeism in communities large and small across the country in recent years. The data confirmed that many children, especially those in economically challenged, fragile, or otherwise marginalized families, experience significant learning loss during the pandemic, exacerbating long-standing gaps between those kids and their more well-off peers. As education leaders and community partners work to accelerate equitable learning recovery, we need to make sure that those kids are in school where they can benefit from all of the school-based efforts that are being advanced. To help inform our collective efforts to boost attendance, starting in the preschool and kindergarten years when children gain those foundational um, academic and social skills, we reached out to our longtime partners at Attendance Works, who have been helping us to lift up everyday attendance as a pillar of the campaign since we launched more than a decade ago. One of the many things that I love about the approach embraced by Attendance Works is the way that they make it explicit how all of us have a role to play in uh, boosting attendance. Teachers and school leaders, of course, but also um, healthcare providers, housing organizations, elected officials, faith communities, business leaders, and yes, philanthropy, as we'll discuss today, including national, state, and local funders. So today we're gonna to explore several examples of the various roles that philanthropy can and does play in responding to the current crisis on chronic absenteeism, some emerging opportunities, and also some strategies for increasing coordination and collaboration across funders seeking to engage in this work. And to begin that conversation, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our panel for today. Welcome first to Holly Coleman, who will share one of our uh, local examples. Holly serves as the program director for the High Quality Education Impact Area at the Hyde Family Foundation, where she leads the foundation's work to transform education outcomes in Memphis, Tennessee. Megan McCormick will share the perspective of a national funder working in this area. Megan serves as the Research and Impact Officer at Overdeck Family Foundation, leading the foundation's investments and in support for research and evidence building. She brings more than 15 years of experience as a social science researcher, including research examining how school and home-based programs and policies influence children's development and ameliorate the negative effects of poverty on child and family well-being. Janice Palmer will provide a state perspective, sharing insights out of both Arizona and Florida. Janice serves as the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs and Policy at the Helios Education Foundation, where she is responsible for identifying Arizona and Florida policy and investment opportunities that leverage and or positively impact the foundation's current investments and ensure current policy and advocacy activities inform and direct the foundation's future work. Welcome also to Jill Pereira, who will share our second local funder example. Jill serves as the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at the United Way of the Greater Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania, where she has held a number of leadership positions going back to 2009, including Director of Community Schools and Vice President of Education and Vice President of Education and Impact. And then to guide us through today's conversation, I'd like to welcome Hetty Chang. Hetty is the founder and executive director of Attendance Works, a national and state level initiative aimed at advancing student success by addressing chronic absence. A founding partner of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, Hetty and her team have helped states and communities across the country understand the importance of tracking chronic absenteeism rather than just uh, average daily attendance and applying proven strategies for encouraging everyday student attendance. In, ad in addition to her deep expertise in student attendance, Hetty also brings experience working in philanthropy to this conversation, having previously served as a senior program officer at the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund. So welcome to all of the panelists, and now I'll pass the mic over to you, Hetty. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that great overview of what we have today. Um, let's go to the next slide, and I'm going to start just by making sure we're all on the same page. You know, uh, one of the unfortunate challenges that we've really seen emerging in the aftermath of the pandemic is chronic absence has nearly doubled. And that's from the 21-22 data. Um, we saw it go from eight to almost 15 million kids. Um, but the 22-23 data also suggests that chronic absence remains extremely high, maybe decreased by only a couple percentage points. And we're still waiting. We don't yet have data on what it looks like this year, but I think it remains a persistent long-term challenge that we 
is going to take all of us working together to address. Next slide. And one of the challenges is it's not just the one out of three, nearly one out of three, or at least still about more than one out of four kids who are chronically absent, who are feeling the effects of this chronic absenteeism. What we saw is that between the pan before the pandemic to now, the number of schools and the number of kids who have who were are in schools with 20% or more levels of chronic absence has increased exponentially. Two thirds of all kids are now in a school with 20% or more levels of chronic absenteeism. When chronic absence is that high, it is affecting everyone. It is affecting the ability of teachers to teach, teachers to set classroom norms, and kids to be able um, to learn. And the dis churn can be a real distraction. So the impact ripples. And then if you go to the next slide, it shows that where we're seeing the highest levels of chronic absence, like 30% or more of kids, and that's just a, a bottom, uh, you know, it's can be 40, 50% in these schools, even more. Where we're seeing the largest numbers of schools with those extremely high levels of chronic absenteeism is in our highest poverty communities. So in our highest poverty communities, it's not only the kids, that there are more kids who are chronically absent, but their schools are being dramatically affected by chronic absenteeism. Next slide. And while these increases are happening at every level, elementary, middle, and high school, in terms of numbers, which is where we have the most schools because they're smaller, so we have more of them across the country, the number of elementary schools with either 30% or more or 20% or more levels of chronic absenteeism has just exploded. Let's say just the 30% or more levels of chronic absence, it went from less than 4,000 to nearly 20,000. And once your levels are at that, that high, you can't, you actually have to have a system and a real thoughtful approach to addressing the issue. You can't just assign it to a social worker. Too many kids. If you go to the next slide, we also know that we have to begin addressing this, starting with our youngest learners. These, This is data from four states, and you see where even when it's overall lower levels of chronic absence, you still see the same pattern. Chronic absence starts out extremely high among our youngest learners. And that's when kids are gaining, this is why this is part of the campaign for grade level reading, gaining those really crucial skills that they'll need later on. And when showing up to school is so important for early literacy and numeracy. Next slide. So you can see chronic absence in pre-K and K, if, if kids are chronically absent then, they're more likely to be chronically absent later. It's not only associated with academic declines, but challenges with educational engagement, social emotional development, and executive functioning. And for our lowest income kids where chronic absence is highest, the adverse impact is actually greater because those students and families are less likely to have the resources to make up for the lost learning opportunities in the classroom. And we know this regular routine of attendance is especially critical because this is your first experience in school. There are many kids, you know, it's pre-K and K where kids are first for the first time really um, joining hands, their parents are joining hands with um, the schools to raise their kids. And when they have that regular routine, it helps kids become less anxious about school, connect to peers as well as teachers, access resources and engage in learning. And the impression of that first partnership is so crucial as kids get older. Next slide. At the same time, we know that when, if we wanna reduce chronic absence, we really have to understand what causes them to miss school. Now, we know some of those issues from before the pandemic, but we actually have to look at what's happening now during and post pandemic, because there are some lingering effects and even new things and challenges that families face. 
port transportation hasn't come back. Housing and food insecurity is at all high time, uh, all time highs. Those issues of aversion, anxiety is greater than ever. And in fact, for kids who let's say didn't go to preschool, there might be even greater anxiety about showing up into kindergarten. Challenges of disengagement with uh, the churn in relationships. And then I think there are real challenges around misconceptions. You know, we always had this challenge. Did kids know, um, did families know that showing up to school regularly in kindergarten really matters? But now we had closed schools down. We provided digital um, virtual learning, which I don't think worked very well in most cases for our youngest learners, and but families might be under the impression that you don't need to go to school to learn. Um, there's really interesting work from Learning Heroes. I saw they were in the mix um, from the report called False Signals, which talks about how we haven't been able to give families very good feedback about um, the learning losses that ha are happening. And so they're seeing, you know, bees, even when their kids might be chronically absent and experiencing learning loss. So how do we then communicate to families what the value of showing up to school every day is? And in the face of continued nervousness about this, what you do when kids are ill, because during the pandemic, we really told families, any sign of illness, got to stay home. But now we're in a different age, but we have to change the health messaging. So these are really challenging. And if you go to the next slide, I would say what we most know we have to address is we got to re-establish these positive conditions for learning, ensuring kids and families feel physically, health, emotionally healthy and safe, a sense of belonging, connection, support, academic challenge and engagement, and that we're investing in the adults, including um, teachers uh, and other school staff whose well-being is so important to the relationship building for making sure that all of these other elements are in place. And if you go to the next slide, we have to recognize that many schools, especially these elementary schools who are unaccustomed to these high levels of chronic absence, need to have support in creating comprehensive approaches that start with the foundational supports and then use data add, to add on supports as needed. Next slide. And we gotta think about how do we ensure the supports we provide are tailored to the realities of the populations that most need them. And we're, there are two ways of thinking about this. This is data from California, and we got it from our website. More websites than ever. Most states in this country now all have cal chronic absence data on it. And in California, you can see from it that there are some groups that are disproportionately affected, like African American, Native American, Hispanic, Latino, or Pacific Islander kids. But if you look at numbers, which is also important, you see that the two thirds of all kindergartners who are chronically absent in California are actually Latino. So that helps give you clues about who are the partnerships, what are the issues, how do we, who do we talk with to find out how we can actually improve attendance. And if you go to the next slide, I want to really talk for a moment, um, taking this privilege that I have from having been a former program officer, about highlighting different ways that funders can truly make a difference. Now, there's a typical investor role, which is, I think, how most people think about foundations. And certainly, founders can fund efforts that uh, are the adoption of effective practices to improve attendance. But funders are also brokers. They can help folks who are doing the work think about the different funding streams. Um, they can be connectors. They can link to groups. Oh, you should be connecting with your expanded learning or your early childhood groups because um, the two of you together could make a difference around attendance. They can be learners, helping us understand what are the causes of absences, especially post-pandemic. What are what do we know about the evidence-based interventions, and how do we best communicate, especially with families? And then they're influencers because funders can build awareness among grantees, policymakers and the public. Um, funders sometimes are long, staying in their jobs longer than the local, the, you know, than the mayor, than the, the governor. And so they can be the constant building of awareness because engaging in this work isn't short term. It takes investment and persistence over time. And with that, it is my privilege to bring our panel of funders. And we're gonna start with Holly, one of our local um, funders, Holly Coleman. Um, and we're going to hear about what does it look like for funders to address 
attendance. And Holly, um, what I'd love is if you could start by telling us a little bit more about the Hyde Family Foundation and what sparked Hyde's interest in working on attendance. Thank you, Hetty. I'm glad to be here today and I'm so excited to join you all. Um, the Hyde Family Foundation is a place-based family foundation in Memphis, Tennessee. And education is one of our key impact areas. We have um, three other impact areas in the arts, arts and culture, um, vibrant spaces in communities and engaged leadership and civic pride. But education is um, very dear to um, our founding trustees heart. And so we spend a lot of time trying to improve education across our city. And Memphis is the largest school district in the state of Tennessee. And um, just a little bit about the district, we unfortunately um, just struggle with having a large percentage of kids that are not on grade level. So we have um, more kids um, not on grade level than on grade level in here in Memphis. And um, we have a high percentage of students that live in concentrated poverty. And um, our district serves a pretty high percentage of students of color. So the majority of our students are African-American in the public school system and a growing number of Latino students as well. And so um, we have some challenges here um, that we are always working on. And we came to uh, learn about chronic absenteeism more actually when the state of Tennessee Department of Education added chronic absenteeism to the accountability framework. And that's something they did around the 2017-18 timeframe. And it was part of their Every Student Succeeds Act plan to the federal government. That's one of the things they were gonna add. And I think that's really when it was elevated and um, became something that our districts across the state started to pay attention to and think about. And it was honestly controversial. There were a lot of district leaders who did not want chronic absenteeism added into the accountability framework, but it's something we started to learn about because we obviously were dealing with, um, you know, again, challenges with how do we get our kids um, on grade level and what are, you know, what are the different barriers that are, that are in the way. And so I think um, we started doing research. That's honestly when we learned about Attendance Works because there aren't, weren't a lot of resources at that time. And Attendance Works was really the key one that we were able to learn from and um, you know, find resources and determine kind of a way forward. And where we started um, you know, was to, where we started was to just elevate this as something that we talked to our schools about. Um, we work with the district here, district leadership, but we also work with a network of charter schools. Um, we are the biggest um, you know, charter school uh, area in the state. And so we have close relationships with a lot of school leaders. So we just started talking with them and learning from them. And I think our trustees got really interested because it's easy to understand. Um, if you're not, if kids aren't in school this many days, then it's difficult for them to learn. So I think it it really was something that we wanted to learn more about. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I do think the fact that it's so common sense allows you to both uh, influence your trustee. Then also, it sounds like you were really playing a role in getting the school folks to not less be scared of this issue and more say, hey, this is an issue that if we understand, we can get to our goals of reading. So what did you end up doing, Holly? So where we started prior to the pandemic um, was we actually started with a pilot. And so again, we have close relationships with a number of charter schools, really over 20 charter organizations, separate charter organizations that between them have probably 45 or so different school sites and um, at least 10,000 students. So we started with a few of them that were willing to raise their hand and recognize that they had a chronic absenteeism challenge. They were some of our charters that had the highest chronic absenteeism. We started with them. We did a pilot. And so really for a couple of the schools, we partnered with communities and schools to put communities and schools um, partnerships in place in their school buildings. For another one of the schools in the pilot, um, they wanted to hire someone that was gonna really focus on chronic absenteeism. Um, so we learned from that, because this was right before the pandemic, we learned how challenging it was to move the needle on chronic absenteeism. We did see some impact in the case management where they 
were really working closely with the, a small number of students that had the highest chronic absenteeism, that intensive case management seemed to really work. However, there wasn't as much success really just across the school. So even though they saw success with those um, students that were really struggling, overall, um, the chronic absenteeism needle didn't move that much. And so we really, we understood that this is a challenge and that there's a, a variety of reasons that are not, um, you know, easily understood. And so I think it that original pilot helped us learn just how many different challenges our families and students were facing and how it also varied by school. So even in communities within our own Memphis, in South Memphis versus North Memphis versus East Memphis, different schools might have very different challenges that were driving their high chronic absenteeism rates. And we saw things like transportation. We don't have a comprehensive transportation system here in Memphis. And a lot of our families struggle with uh, challenges and in charter schools don't always have buses. So that was another area. We, we're a logistics hub. And so a lot of our families work at night, for example, and they might get off work late and then um, decide that it's too late to take the kids to school and then they just miss the day. Um, but we also have homeless, um, you know, some pockets that have homeless challenges, a lot of mobility. And we also um, have health challenges and things like that. So we really we're able to establish that, you know, this is not just one or two causes here and there's not one silver bullet really. And so we really were going to dig into it when the pandemic hit. So then as everyone knows, attendance became very um, scrambled and hard to understand in the hybrid and virtual space. Um, and But we started to look at it again um, as we were emerging from um, the pandemic. And I'd say the data from 2021, 2022 was probably when we took a look at how our charter schools were doing. They had always been- And, and Holly, we may need to do this like in two more minutes so okay. that we can get on to- um, Yeah, definitely. Also hear from, hear from Jill. Such rich information that you're offering. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah, um, so definitely. So we basically looked at the schools that had the highest chronic absenteeism, and we realized that our charters were really struggling um, more than the district was. And we took, um, basically, we went back to Attendance Works um, and were able to find out that they were, you know, willing to offer a cohort. Um, to really work on one on one with our schools um, and, you know, have them work together to tackle their chronic absenteeism challenge. And so we went to schools, 16 of our schools with the highest chronic absenteeism rate. Um, we divided them in between an elementary cohort and a secondary cohort of middle and high schools. We have great relationships with our schools. So it wasn't a I got your moment. It was really more of a let's work together, you know, let me help. And all of them, you know, we asked. It wasn't something we said you should do this or you need to do this. Do you want to do this? We saw that you're, you're really struggling with chronic absenteeism. And so all of them were willing to do it and excited about it. So um, the slide that was just up just really quickly, one thing that we found that works here in Memphis is for our schools to receive one on one support from industry experts and then also to be part of a cohort where they work together because they really find a lot of value in seeing what's happening in other schools that have similar demographics and similar challenges, um, you know, in, in um, communities that look like theirs. And so we were able to put together this community of practice with Attendance Works um, being the facilitator and the designer to really help them spend a year understanding what their um, challenges were with chronic absenteeism and working on um, reducing reducing the chronic absenteeism rate. So you can see here just um, a quick overview of the different sessions um, that were set up over a year. And they were a mix of um, in-person and virtual group sessions where everyone's together. And they also do some breakout work during those sessions. And then also in between, each of them is getting one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so we liked it because it really is, was able to meet the different schools where they are. Everyone was not in the same place as far as education or even the challenges they faced. And this allowed them to learn from each other, but then also get the one-on-one -on -one support they needed. Thank you so much, Holly. What a rich um, explanation of how this shifted um, and your approach uh, evolved over time. Um, I would love to have Jill join us now. And Jill, tell us a little bit first again about um, your United Way and how you operate and how did chronic absence become something that you all took on? 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Hetty. Thanks for having me uh, campaign. So I work for a United Way. We are about 1,100 strong across the globe. Our particular United Way is located in kind of eastern Pennsylvania. We have a footprint of three counties, covers urban, rural, suburban, about a million people, 23 different school districts, and a rapidly growing healthy aging population. Um, and we shifted, as most United Ways have, from being a fundraising organization interested in community to being a social impact organization that raises money in order to create large scale social change. So that's really important context for us. Um, just last week, we celebrated our campaign closing, raised $25 million. Again, just to give a little bit of context for the scope of what we're trying to do, about 40 staff and an additional 40 folks that come to us through AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps Vista uh, service members and interns to really drive that change with lots and lots of partners. And so um, we have a big goal around education, ensuring every child is ready for school. Um, ready to learn and successful in school so that they can graduate ready for life, career, and college. So we've been investing in community schools since 2005. We've been partnered with the National Campaign for uh, the National Coalition for Community Schools since that time. We became a, aware of attendance works early on in our community school work, somewhere 2007, 8, 9. Um, again, in 2012, we joined the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading when we launched Lehigh Valley Reads, and Attendance Works was there again with one of those key pillars being chronic absence. Um, and so we integrated our grade level reading focus into our community school initiative, which gave us this really powerful opportunity to look at how the community school vehicle could begin to address key barriers to learning, such as chronic absence, summer slide, K ready, um, as we were kind of journeying forward on improvements in those other milestones like third grade reading, eighth grade reading and math, and ultimately graduation. And so, so it aligns to bring up the slides. Um, in just a sec, I'll just say it aligns with all of our other investments. We invest about 80% of our discretionary grant funding into our education goal. We invest in a mix of systems change strategies and direct service programs, and I'll have a slide on that in just a second. Um, and again, to note, we view our the community school strategy as that key and central element around which we embed other funding, other bodies of work, other um, ways to build capacity. So currently we're investing in um, infrastructure in 33 community schools in five different districts to move the needle in those academic indicators, um, but we also recognize all of the social fabric that needs to be interconnected and all of the other partners that can be brought to bear to create those conditions and remove uh, barriers like chronic absenteeism. So if you want to bring up those slides, I can just share briefly about what we're doing to address attendance. So from a systems perspective, we partnered with the system sanctuary. I can drop a slide into the chat that I didn't get in ahead of time. Um, and they really help us look at it in four different layers and I'll just run through them. We, we invest in awareness building, right? We need to change the narrative um, across the community. We need to educate about what what are the reasons for chronic absenteeism? So back in 2017, we launched the Challenge 5 campaign. It was heavily informed by the great work happening in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We saw a huge success pre-COVID, pre move from in the teens of chronic absenteeism, the high teens, down to single digits um, by 2019, which was awesome. At the policy level, so thinking about how we shift policies, um, you know, staff leaders here really became experts in understanding chronic absenteeism way before it was the norm in our school districts. We helped to get it embedded in um, our state policy around our Every School, Every Student Succeeds Act. We helped to get it on the table in our school districts. So I think funders have a role to play in thinking about how to shift local, state, and even national policy. Um, the layer around innovation and capacity building, I mentioned all of our amazing AmeriCorps Vistas and interns. We have 
placed them inside of school districts. We've placed them with partner organizations and community, all in an effort to both understand from, from families what are the real barriers to everyday attendance, and also to help our school districts look at data differently, look at the research that Attendance Works is cranking out, and figure out how to pilot some new things, nudge letters, walking school bus, right? Lots of different practices. And then we're we're certainly focused at the grassroots level on building deep relationships with other people and organizations that can be connectors and providers of service to remove some of those um, some of those obstacles. So you can see here our attendance our our attendance rate and our chronic absenteeism rate. Our goal by 2030 is to get back to six percent chronic absence across our region. In some of our schools during um, just after COVID, it was as high as 67 percent of our of our students were chronically absent in particular schools. So average, the schools that we're working in for community schools are some of our highest need across the region. In 22-23, we dropped back down to 20%, and that's because we're focused on it, right, with our partners and our educators. Um, on the this second slide here, yeah, I'm sorry, if you want to move to that okay, second slide. Ahead. Just in terms of the numbers, I, I was kind of shocked when I looked back over the last six years at how much money we have invested into different areas of strategy to address chronic absenteeism. Some of this is addressing it directly and some of it is a little bit peripheral, but when we think about positive youth development programming, so making sure that kids have things that they want to engage in after school as a carrot to get them to come to school more often, mentoring programs in school and out of school, case management, that's for students and families. Post-COVID, we spent um, some investment on housing navigators to make sure that families could stay in their homes and avoid eviction. Social emotional learning and behavioral health, everything from individual or group counselors in the schools on site to um, uh, SEL programming, mindfulness, and things that will really help to change the culture inside of the school. And then trauma-informed care training and support, we lifted an entire coalition called Resiliently High Valley that's really focused on training youth and family serving professionals, including teachers, on how to understand trauma and mitigate it so that kids are coming into welcoming environments, even if they're coming from, um, you know, a circumstance that might have them wanting to not engage with, with, um, with other folks. So just a snapshot and happy to um, unpack that later. That is so helpful. And it's really incredible to see how you're looking at how chronic apps affects different kinds of investments. Um, sometimes we think about attendance uh, as its own thing when it's actually integrated with all of our investments. Holly and Jill are going to come back because we're going to have a chance to talk across our panel. But with this, I actually would like to move over to Janice. So we're going up a level um, and we are now um, looking at what happens at the state level. So can you tell us a little bit more about Helios, how you operate as a funder and how you got into attendance? Thank you, Hetty. So I'm happy to be here. So who is Helios? Um, Helios Education Foundation, we exist to support post-secondary attainment for low-income and underrepresented communities in both Arizona and Florida. So on the next slide, how do we do it? We know that we can't do it alone and post-secondary success also starts early. So we focus on three areas, third grade reading, college going and enrollment, and attainment. Um, of two and four year degrees. And so we work with statewide data, but we also have internal metrics to ensure that our work is focused on results because we know what happens in the next five years will impact the next generation. So easily, why chronic absenteeism? We can do all of these things effectively, but if students aren't in classrooms, we're not gonna be successful. And the next slide, you know, most importantly for um, who Helios is, is that we are more than a grant maker. We use public policy, research and data, community investments and communications all together to leverage systemic change. And I think the work of chronic absenteeism is a great example to, to see this work in action. So if we go to kind of the next slide, the Arizona story is, you know, chronic absenteeism has been an issue um, on Arizona's radar for some time. Um, Arizona is a highly mobile um, student population that was showing up in the, in the data. And if you go to the next slide, similar to what Holly mentioned, is that chronic absenteeism has been included in Arizona's A through F accountability system since 2016, 2017. Uh, but it's an option for accelerator points. And that's, you know, if a student is showing a decrease or holding steady in their chronic absenteeism rate. 
And, you know, we were very sensitive to the fact that schools aren't solely responsible for chronic absenteeism by any stretch, but schools can obviously pay, play a critical role in addressing it, and it's not going to change if we're not measuring it. And we also knew that COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the issue. And with that in mind, Helios partnered with WestEd, it's a national nonpartisan research agency, to look at chronic absenteeism in Arizona from 2017 to 2021. We really wanted to look at pre-COVID, post-COVID in the kindergarten through eighth grade area. And we are currently conducting follow-up research for grades nine through 12 that will be released um, this fall. And if you look at the next slide, as the research was being finalized, uh, Helios engaged with our phenomenal partner, Read On Arizona. It's our state's early literacy initiative. It's a, it's a um, collective impact model um, on how they can take this work into action. So we held this joint Helios Read On convening in January, 2023 to elevate the issue with over 150 thought leaders, including our own Hetty Chang um, as the keynote to really shine a spotlight on um, not only the issue, but what schools are doing um, with this work and how they're finding success to really have some takeaways for others. And so in addition to um, the Helios West Ed research, we also highlighted a fantastic tool that I hope you'll take a look at um, is Maplet. It's a comprehensive mapping tool that includes chronic absenteeism as a field that you can do deep dives at the local level as well as the state level. And so at the convening, um, it was announced that Read On Arizona would lead a statewide task force on chronic absence to assist in two ways, for local schools by creating a toolkit that schools can use, kind of a small P policy, um, and then a statewide level through policy change, including tackling that chronic absence definition of which we have, we have an issue about mobility that needs to be addressed um, in Arizona. Um, Helios has also invested in, an, in um, to expand the reach of coaching mentoring work to Valley Sun United Way that's working in partnership with Read On Arizona. They had received some federal discretionary funds. We augmented that to expand the reach across Arizona. And so if you see from the Arizona story, really research led to communications, convening, led to policy, led to investment, and will likely, likely lead back around to policy for a holistic look at chronic absenteeism. And Janice, Hewlett works in two states, so you just shared the uh, Arizona story. Um, what does it look like in, um, in Florida, where you also are heavily invested, and but I think has a very different set of conditions? Yeah, yeah. The Florida story is a little bit newer, so thank you, Hetty. And But um, what's lucky is just like Helios can't do it alone, we have a fantastic partner on the next slide in the Florida um, Alliance of Children's Councils and Trust Fact and the Florida Grade Level Reading Campaign. Um, and what's interesting with having this cross state is that um, uh, both, both uh, Fact and the Florida Grade Level Reading Campaign were able to attend that chronic absence convening in Arizona. And they were able to take that back, that work, and leverage kind of a broader investment that's been made for cross-state early learning um, collaboration. And they brought a group of committed leaders, including the Florida Department of Education and key policymakers to do a deep dive in chronic absenteeism. And one of those policymakers, Representative Trabolsi, really ran with that work and invited Attendance Works and Helios um, to present on chronic absenteeism um, just this past year, past December, uh, to our House Education Quality Subcommittee. And so while policy wasn't passed this session, we'll be back ne next session to get that work done. Um, and in the meantime, um, just this last month, Helios rece released new research in partnership with the Central Florida Education Ecosystem Database, CFEED, it's a name, um, that focuses on Orange and Osceola school districts, um, kind of taking a deep dive there as well. And so if you look at Arizona, there was one set of directions that happened, but in Florida, really, it was partner investment that led to a convening, that led to policy, that led to our research, and now it's going to wrap back around back to policy. So uh, look forward to the questions, and, and thank you, Hetty. Thank you, Janice. Such a rich story of how you take these different strategies, not just grant making, and apply them in different states. Now I'd like to ask Megan to join us. Megan, um, you know, uh, you all work at the national level. So tell us more, a little bit more about Overdeck and how you all became interested um, in this issue of chronic absenteeism. Yeah, thank you. Um, so 
Next slide, please. The Overdeck Foundation is really explicitly focused on this broader mission of opening doors for every child in the U.S. by measurably enhancing education both inside and outside of the classroom. And we take this national focus on investing in high impact organizations that can really, really move the needle on supporting not only outcomes for kids in school, but also outcomes for them outside of school and inspiring them in STEM um, and enhancing their enjoyment and engagement in learning. Next slide. Um, we reckon we have recognized in the last year, and I should I should note that I'm fairly new to the foundation, so this is a collective recognition um, for my colleagues as well, really spearheading this, that chronic absenteeism is a significant barrier to achieving that mission. So just presenting some data from the New York Times um, recent report that I'm sure all of you have seen, with the source being uh, Nat Malkus at American Enterprise Institute, but really flagging this significant increase in chronic absenteeism pre-post pandemic, really doubling the number of students that we're seeing with um, an observation that this is not necessarily limited to certain types of schools or populations, but is really expanding across the entire country in all settings. So it's not just affecting, um, it's, it's not just affecting the types of organizations that we invest in nationally, but it's really affecting all schools and districts. Next slide. And as Hedy flagged in the beginning of our talk today, um, the majority of American schools are affected by this issue. Um, and what's really concerning to us is that perhaps we would have thought we would have observed a significant improvement in the 2022-2023 school year after the return to um, in-person learning across the country, but that didn't really happen. We all only saw a very small reduction. And critically, there are significant equity implications for this issue, with chronic absent rates being highest in the districts serving the children who are from underrepresented and marginalized groups, who we know are likely to be most negatively affected by not being in school. Next slide. And so recognizing that we are investing in four areas, early impact, teacher quality, innovative schools, and out-of-school time STEM, We've seen that across all of those portfolios, there's a significant um, family engagement component that is critical to each of those areas. And if we're unable to make significant investments and impactful investments in family engagement, we really can't deliver on the mission of the organization. Next slide. Yeah. And so, so uh, okay. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, you might. So I was just going to say, so this is really spearheaded in this recognition, realizing that without enhancing and supporting families and children and students and addressing this critical issue. We, our investments that we're making across these types of organizations that we work with, they're not really gonna be able to succeed on the overall goal unless we address this kind of um, issue and get to the root cause of it. And that's it. So I think that's then connected to you all then as a foundation have really started to focus on this issue of research and mm -hmm. generating evidence. Can you tell us a bit more about what you're trying to do? Yes. So we've recognized that um, we think there, just go to the last slide, there are some kind of key areas that we don't know a lot about and we don't have good rigorous evidence. So we obviously know like from the slide that I just showed you that chronic absenteeism is a problem. We don't feel like we really need more evidence that this is a problem. There's a number of descriptive studies across the country that have looked at the data in different ways and pulled different demographic groups. And we see pretty consistently that we need to take action. But most of the evidence that we have on the implications of chronic absenteeism and the potential root causes and drivers are from pre-pandemic studies. And even then the literature wasn't highly robust because there wasn't honestly a huge interest in this topic. Um, I actually had been trying, when I was on my re a, a researcher in my prior life, I've been trying to get some work funded and there really just wasn't a key, a core interest in it without kind of linking it to student achievement outcomes. Um, and so we are limited in the pre-pandemic data. We know that there's something else going on that is not gonna be accounted for with any studies pre-pandemic. And so there's a clear need to make significant investments now in studies and settings post-pandemic that can help us both identify the root causes of chronic absenteeism to help inform policy implementation of approaches to address the issue and to inform the development of interventions and tools that can help districts and states make change. 
um, and actually test the efficacy of different things that states and districts are trying right now to see how impactful they are, to document the implementation, and then to disseminate those findings more broadly so that people can get access to information on what works. Um, and so what we're really interested in is funding research in those areas to identify those root causes, to study policies and interventions and identify the ones that are effective for improving student attendance with an explicit focus on promoting more equitable learning outcomes and attendance outcomes and on documenting and, engage and examining current state and district policies that are being addressed. Next slide. Um, and we really do think that by funding a kind of core set of studies on this topic, so not just one-off studies, but making a significant investment in understanding the linkages between different research questions, we can make um, some improvement in this area and provide needed rigorous information to the field. So we think it's important to look at the collective body of evidence when making recommendations and understanding the issue. Um, we're examining, we're exploring and investing in studies that explore multiple hypotheses um, so that look at the issue from different perspectives and use different types of methodologies so that we can hopefully triangulate findings to come to some sort of core message instead of learnings. And we're hoping to use our ability, our kind of like role as a funder to serve as a convening um, convening creator, um, potentially in partnership with folks like Attendance Works, to support collaborative research so that research can speak, researchers can speak to one another and learn from one another rather than operating in silos. We do think it's going to be critical to this type of investment being impactful for the field, though, we'll be collaborating with other funders and stakeholders to really raise awareness for the importance of this research and ensure that it's used in a high impact way. Megan, what makes that collaboration on research possible with other funders? Um, I think what's really what's really helpful is that multiple funders, not just Overdeck, but a host of others in the space, are kind of realizing that this is a significant issue that affects all of the other work and the strategies that we are engaged in moving forward. And so by connecting with conveners like attendance, attendance works, like leaders in this space, funders have been able to make connections with each other to understand what their potential research strategy and interests are, to identify what's unique and what we potentially can collaborate on in order to kind of create more communication and dialogue on the issue. And so at Overdeck, we've been kind of doing this work and exploring some partnership with SERPI at ASU and potentially some others who are also kind of taking a, um, like reflecting on the need for better evidence in this space. And importantly, not just to, again, be funding random studies that we never actually know the findings for and can never tie to the specific policy questions at hand, but can really be used in a collective sense to move the field forward and make better decisions that really serve to improve outcomes for students in schools. Thank you, Megan. Really appreciate it. I want to invite all of our uh, funders, so Jill and Holly and Janice, um, to join back up. Um, and I, I want to explore this issue of funder collaboration a little bit more. And by the way, if you're in the in the, um, I know we have one question in the Q and A, but if other folks have questions, this is we're going to be getting to them. So you should put that into the Q and A. But I, 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 what do you see as um, where have you seen collaboration with other funders work um, in this area and how could we build on that given there's such a huge interest, but also I think a real need to learn from each other about what's working. H have you had really um, effective collaborations with other funders in your work? What does that look like and what makes it possible? Yeah, I, I can share. I mean, collaboration is the way to get work done. And so even in the funder world, um, at the, so we have lots of partnerships with lots of companies, right? They are funders. They have corporate social responsibility expectations. They have partnered with our United Way and are supporting our community school infrastructure. Um, some of that is what's then supporting the ability to uh, intentionally address chronic absenteeism, right? So I think um, we've spent a lot of time educating the corporate community on the realities of public education and why there's a need for philanthropy to be at the table. Um, so I think that's one example. Um, 
I had another example, but I lost it. Okay. I think Holly was going to say something. So Holly. Uh, yeah, I was going to say here in Memphis, we have a lot of examples of funders coming together to collaborate. And this um, example with Attendance Works was one of them that we were able to actually fund um, the pilot or excuse me, the cohort for 16 schools by getting two other funders to come alongside us and learn with us and um, get interested in it and decide to put resources in to, to fund to fund the cohort. And, and the collaboration is great because there are times when each of us can really dig into something and maybe do the research and then elevate it and bring it to our other, other funders and they can learn about it as well and get interested because it's difficult, you know, with everyone's capacity um, as local funders for everyone to do the research. And, and so we're able to kind of um, leverage each other to figure out what, you know, what issues are important to us and, and learn together. So we really have a great collaboration here. It's the only way we're able to get things done, honestly, because at, at Hyde Foundation alone, we don't have resources to do all the work we want to do, but we're able to get a lot more done when we can bring other funders alongside of us. Um. Janice, would you add into this? Yeah, I would. I would. I would almost expand it. I don't. I think it's beyond just funders, but it's also fundees um, that are working in partnership. Because I think one of the things that we're reflecting upon is because I don't want to lose Megan's point because I thought Megan's point was so well taken about how so many folks thought that chronic absenteeism was a pandemic issue, things would go back to normal. And so now when we're seeing it's a pervasive issue that things have fundamentally shifted, I also think it's an opportunity for funders to take a look at our current investments and seeing how we can integrate within our current investments that absenteeism is weaved in throughout and that our fundees are also looking at this as well. It's not a one-off, it's part of our holistic way of, of trying to move the needle for all students to be successful. Janice, I wanna build off that because I wonder if there are lessons there also for the public sector because that's also another critical source of funding. And wondering, especially because there are huge concerns, ESSER funds are ending, but this issue of chronic absence, which might be related to the pandemic, surely ain't um, ending at the same time <laughs> as our ESSER funds are phasing out. So what does that mean about um, the partnerships with public funders and how we influence them and how we ensure that there's a sustained approach um, I would open it up to you, but then also to anyone else or Megan, if you wanted to speak to that one. Yeah, I would just, I would, I think that's a great kind of transition to what I was also thinking about related to the collaboration piece, which is that the White House has made this like its number one fundamental issue and in investment in education. And we have found that that's really galvanized folks in the field who maybe were on the fence about supporting work in the space, but are now increasingly being made aware of this in the context of the ESSER funding cliff as well. And we see that our investments in research really can be, we think, catalytic for helping to support districts to identify things that are effective, given that there's going to be a limited set of resources that they can invest in addressing this challenge. At the, and at the same time, continuing to have to invest in, in school supports like tutoring and other issues to address learning, learning challenges related to the pandemic. Um, and so from our perspective, we're really focused on trying to figure out what works as fast as possible, given that there's this impending and looming um, funding shortage that's going to be kind of coming up, depending on what districts decide to do and requesting extensions, it's a, there might be it might be a little longer than it's expected. Um, but it's really related to this issue of um, highlighting this as the number one thing that we want to make sure that people have good evidence on and they can use their resources smart in a smart way. I, I also wonder in this, like I keep thinking about to what extent is it new interventions? To what is extent, uh, extent is it um, catalyzing uh, more joining, like expanded mm -hmm. learning? How does that contribute to student connectedness? How could you leverage your high dosage tutoring because you already got tutors who are meeting kids three or four times, they could be addressing attendance. Uh, I saw in the chat, there was conversations about health supports and what is the role of health, uh, you know, of school nurses in addressing attendance, but how do you sustain that? Um, I'd be really curious uh, for Holly and Jill who work at the local level. What do you see as 
most effective happening and how are you thinking about making sure that gets sustained over time at the local level? Um, yeah, that made me think of an example, a great example here in Memphis where um, funders were really able to come alongside our district and the topic was actually early literacy. So, you know, we have some policy in Tennessee that supported early literacy and we came together. One of the catalysts was we have all these different community partners as well as the public sector that wants to come alongside the public district to make education better. And so early literacy was one reason that we, one thing that we could all kind of galvanize around and come together on and bring the community partners together because they said we want to help but we're not sure how and so we were able to really put together this comprehensive early literacy strategy driven by our school district and attendance and chronic absenteeism is one of the things that really rose out of that you know we kind of came up with um, a number of different strategic priorities around early literacy and getting kids on reading on grade level by third grade but attendance rose to the top as one of the key areas is one where community partners could help because the district said there's only so much we can do. Um, you know, we need the community to come alongside of us. And so it was a great um, really platform for us to look at the data together, the community partners and the district, and to say, where can we lean in as, as community to help? And it was also at the same time, we were looking at how ESSER funds were being used and uh, on attendance initiatives as one of those things. And one of the things that the group demanded was, let's look at how we're spending our funding and let's look at the return on investment so that when ESSER funds do run out, we can make better decisions about what needs to continue. And so so we were able to really shine a light in that way on attendance. It's like, and like you said, Hetty, um, tutoring was another one. And honestly, like one of the criteria for schools to even get the tutoring that was available through a state grant was attendance, you know, that schools could only kind of be uh, participants and get the funding and get the tutors if they were able to show that, you know, they had enough students that um, didn't have, you know, attendance problems. So it was another way to just continue to shine a light on how important attendance is, but in the context of, you know, this greater um, topic that everyone's, you know, really interested in. There is another question in the chat about sp strategies for incentivizing parents um, and what works there. I'm wondering if any of you either have seen the research or found in your local work that there was an effective approach to incentivizing parents to, to promote good attendance. Yeah, I was going to mention this actually as part of the answer to the last question around um, what are we going to do now that Essers is, is kind of leaving. And the truth is, I think what we're finding is there's a mindset and a desire to focus on chronic absence that has to be parallel with funding being available. Because we've had schools that have had funding, but didn't quite have the mindset around every child individual and uh, individually known or families as partners in the educational process. And so creating those conditions inside of a school where there's just a real value on people and and human kindness is really important. And then and then the money is something that is jointly sought after, right, among the partners that are really trying to focus on that. So um, in our community schools at the elementary level, we have started hearing both the pushback from some saying, well, parents, you know, parents are the reason why kids are chronically absent. We can't, we can't put it on the kids. And um, schools saying, um, kids and, and parents equally have a responsibility to be engaging in school and how are we going to ensure that they want to be here? So simple thank you uh, postcards, home to families, certificates for um, families that are making sure their kids are showing up more this month than last month, um, conversations with families around the positive um, data trends that are starting to to show because their child has been in school more this quarter than last quarter, right? I think all of that is placing that value on a parent as um, a co-educator, if you will, for our young people. And it is starting to gain traction. I think um, in, in our community school work, it's starting to gain traction. Yeah, well, it's an interesting, there's, we think about often incentives as physical things as opposed to relationships um, and attitudes and how parents 
feel incentivized by the way they're treated. Um, one of the things I keep going back to is, uh, and we just did a webinar on uh, leveraging teachers at the front line, because the truth is the people who have most interaction with kids are teachers. But when parents and teachers feel that they're in partnership with each other, they are much more likely to want to show their have their kids show up to school. So the incentive is actually partly the relationship uh, that allows parents to feel valued and trusted and changing the mindset of blame is pretty essential. That's what I'm I'm hearing um, from you, Jill. And that's why things though, like parent-teacher home visiting, or I saw that Kari Sullivan from Connecticut here is talking about the LEAP home visiting, um, which again was one of the post, you know, something that proved effective during the pandemic, but it's because they fundamentally changed the mindset of the person talking with the parents started building a relationship and then from that relationship figured out how to connect parents to other barriers. Um, what else are examples of how community partners can really contribute to this work? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's coming out of this, this chronic absence task force is there will be a resource guide, but we're also trying to elevate some great practices that are already happening within school systems because peer-to-peer -peer is always um, better than you know a top-down approach. And so we have examples of where at Abedell Elementary, it was really just looking at the data, taking a look and seeing those students that are missing school. And as you said, Hetty, creating that one-on-one -on -one relationship. It doesn't have to necessarily be a teacher. It could be the attendants. It could be front office. It could be a janitor. It could be a uh, school bus driver. I think we underestimate our school bus drivers and the relationship that's there. And so, you know, taking a look at data, being able to be inclusive and letting parents know that that the school also notices when, there's, when their child is, is in school or not in school. But then we can also go back to a Washington Elementary School, which is the largest uh, elementary school in Arizona. Arizona, where they have, you know, pizza parties. I saw that in the chat where pizza parties where not only the student is receiving a gift card for uh, great attendance, but the parent is also receiving that as well. So they feel involved in that and that it really is a joint effort to also having car parades, you know, just basically having the intentional focus on having students in schools matters. We see you, that relationship matters. And you know, that builds upon itself, um, I think, as a best practice to getting students back in school. Um, yeah, I will, yeah, go ahead, well, Megan. Please. I would just add another example of um, a research project that we're considering looking at in L.A. County that's really considering partnerships with um, mental health providers in the community to really understand how the interaction of mental health and school attendance is operating and how community-based organizations that aim to support youth mental health can potentially be leveraged to support better better uh, attendance outcomes. I think that's kind of a nice um, response to some of the current dialogue about, especially why older kids, maybe not this, this might not extend to younger children, but middle school age kids, high school age kids, we may be seeing some challenges with absenteeism related to mental health, anxiety, depression, et cetera. Well, I think this issue of mental health and health partners is another real example. And I don't know, Holly or Jill, how much, especially uh, as community schools approaches, because I've seen that um, health partners are pretty crucial now, uh, both having school nurses, and sometimes school nurses are funded by schools. Sometimes school nurses are funded by the public health clinic, but they're located at schools. Um, you can also create partnerships between uh, federally qualified health centers and schools, but everything from how do people know when to send their kid to school, when their kid has the sniffles or a cough, having partnerships with health where people can do it too. How do we invest in keeping kids from getting sick in the first place? Um, making sure, you know, immunizations are at an all time low. It's actually quite scary. Um, we, uh, to dental care, to uh, hygiene habits, to these are all different ways that health partners could actually play a role. Have any of you um, been able to really involve health partners in your work? And physical health partners can also connect to mental, physical or mental health partners or some combination. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, I think we, we've done a really nice job of engaging our local health networks and our, our mental health providers inside of our school district partnerships 
Um, I don't know that we explicitly looked at it as a chronic absenteeism strategy, right? It was kind of whole child, how do we make sure kids have what they need to be healthy, body and mind, and co-locating those services in the school makes it easy to access them. And so it's kind of, you know, doing both at the same time, I get with the underlying benefit being kids are then going to be more able, ready, um, and available to be in school. So um, thanks for giving the reframe on that, Hedy. I don't think we thought about some of that as a, as a chronic absence strategy. Well, I think it's an interesting thing. I mean, I see that all the time. Like sometimes you see separate briefs. These are our investments attendance. These are investments in health um, and I and health and mental health. I, people do see those connections. But I, I keep thinking, well, if we thought health was a part of it, you'd make sure that health practitioners are part of your attendance team. They're equipping teachers about messaging around the health issues. Because I also hear times where families will say, hey, I sent my kid to school and the teacher sent them right back home because they had a minor cough. I think it's allergies, but you know, the teacher didn't think that and they sent them home, which then makes that feeling of, well, school's kind of optional, even more prevalent that we worry about because families don't feel like school's a certain, you know what I mean? It, 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 but that ability then to, if we think that sector should be involved, it's also about providing, equipping them with the data and having the conversation across sectors. And I also wonder if this also allows for a different kind of, um, collaboration, with, for example, with health funders. I was going to say we have seen that, um, and it was an area where philanthropy got involved. Um, one was with the communities and schools example, um, with the pilot we did before the pandemic, that one of the things that was tried at one of the schools was to include a school psychologist. And the school um, saw such a benefit from that school psychologist that they actually um, Communities and schools wasn't so happy about it, but they ultimately hired that <laughs> hired that school psychologist as a full time person on their staff. And so it really was a matter of something they probably wouldn't have done with their budget. Um, they wouldn't have known the value of it, but because philanthropy was able to come in and supply that resource for a year or two, you know, they were able to see the value of it and looking at the data and the difference it made. And then when it came time for their own budget, you know, they made the tough choices to reallocate and be able to keep that psychologist. Um, and another thing we did, which I think school nurses luckily have come back into, you know, the understanding of how important they are with the pandemic, but that was another um, collective effort here in um, Memphis where funders came together to fund school nurses and look at the data over time um, at a time when maybe all schools didn't have school nurses. And so I think, you know, we definitely have um, looked at that and seen like the, the investments in healthcare be really important in keeping kids in school more, more often. Yeah, that's one where I think the data has to lead to the solution, right? Because we we there are some things that we know, healthcare, there's transportation, we know there's some overarching issues, but until you see the data in the local schools to make a, a plan for what makes sense in that community, you know, what's happening on some of our tribal communities that were really decimated during COVID-19 are different unique needs than what are happening within a more urban setting. So I think the first thing is to get the data for each school take a look at that and have a holistic view too. It's not, it's the school staff, it's teachers, it's parents understanding what is so that we can start taking a look at creating a plan that works. And I, I worry sometimes that because it is such a, you know, when you look at these aggregate numbers, they're so overwhelming that when you take a look at it for one school site or school system, it starts becoming doable when you take a look at the students that are missing school, what it takes to create that relationship. And then you start building that school culture that takes over and builds that community uh, moving forward. So what I worry about most right now is that we become overwhelmed and just throw our hands up and, and not take the, the steady steps necessary to get our kids back in school. You know, I, I, I saw a question about ecosystem in the Q&A, and it strikes me that each one, Janice, you're talking about take the doable ecosystem, <laughs> you know, start with the school, you can build up from schools to then your districts, but at the, schools are actually where the, the, the rubber hits the road. Um, what are you, there's also questions here about um, transportation. 
What have you all seen in terms of partnering with community, with public, with, with government around addressing transportation, which remains like healthcare as a high on the list challenge that prevents so many kids from getting to school? And I can speak to this um, a little bit in that I think this is one of the more challenging issues that we have noted in our review of the evidence and seeing kind of like what potential cost effective strategies could be given the significant cost. And it, it does seem to me like it's a huge challenge more because of some of these places that we're looking at. Um, depending on the state and setting, there's different laws for actually what is required for transportation for students. And there is just a huge bureaucratic challenge in terms of launching effective transportation supports um, across many of those places that don't necessarily require transportation past a certain distance from the school. Um, and I think it's been interesting for us because we've been interested in investing in research to understand the effect of transportation on absenteeism. And we've actually been talking about whether that's the most impactful way to use our research dollars, given the challenges associated with actually changing transportation policies well, and the cost implications for districts. So I would be really love, I, I'm so interested in it, but that keeps coming up as a significant barrier. And so I would love to hear if others on the panel are kind of tackling this issue. And, and I wonder, there's both the transportation systems, but there are also smaller, I don't know if thought, like there's the apps where you can arrange car rides with, and there's one app um, that helps you identify all the school kids and families in your school and then see where they are. I mean, you have to opt into it, um, uh, but the, the, there's, there's the big transportation systems and then there's like, you know, the yeah. school bus kind of, <laughs> and, and everywhere in between. I, mm -hmm. I'd be particularly curious um, whether Jill or Holly or maybe Janice in the local work around in Avondale and other places, have we seen some creative transportation solutions? I mean, I wish I could say I'd seen something at a systems level, but really we do work with a lot of small schools that maybe only have a few hundred students and we have seen where it really is diving in with those relationships and having someone at the school that can um, learn where families live and start to connect them. You know, so we do have a lot of kind of carpooling and just like getting people, getting families connected to each other that are in the same area to help each other. I mean, we have examples of our, you know, literally every school doesn't have enough staffing and it's not possible, but we have, you know, where school leaders and um, the, the others in the building, like literally will pick kids up, you know, if they, if they have to, if parents are having um, specific challenges, you know, or again, kind of connecting them, you know, with others that can pick them up. We don't. We haven't had as much. I know some were looking into kind of the ride shares, but there's some limitations, right, with the laws. But you know, I know that people have been trying to come up with um, with innovative solutions because unfortunately, like our public transportation system just isn't expansive and reliable enough here to you know time to be a solution for a lot of students in schools. Yeah. I'll just add, we don't have a silver bullet here either, but local, um, uh, one of our local districts has partnered with our transportation um, commission. And I see somebody said about free rides. So we have that in place for one of our kind of urban districts that doesn't have busing. Large scale, this is a real uh, interesting uh, cross connect between our healthy aging work and our education work. Our healthy aging work is um, looking to create an age-friendly Lehigh Valley, and in doing so, partnered with our planning commission, which oversees all of the roadways, et cetera, across the whole region, and we've just got done doing some walk audits, so auditing intersections that um, folks in community have identified they feel unsafe, and so we just did a, a walk audit of several hundred intersections, again, across the region. The initial focus was to help the community be safe for people of all ages with a kind of a bent towards healthy aging. And it has served, we did some of them with a focus on our community schools, how our kids and families able to navigate the neighborhoods around community schools <clears throat> as they're walking to school during the day. So we're, we'll be excited to see the planning commission has access to some resources that they'll be then looking at making improvements to those intersections. So it doesn't solve the, how do we get kids transported, but 
looking at safer walkways. There's another question in the chat about kids with disabilities. So we know that kids with IEPs with disabilities, national data and local data almost all play this out, have among the highest levels of chronic absence. Curious if any of you have been able to examine that, look at the factors, or even bring in partners or uh, integrate with special ed within communities, within school districts, to better address the particular challenges facing kids with special, special needs. So one, we were examining one um, state and district that based on the pandemic basically was requiring that if you left to go to a doctor's appointment or any sort of individual appointment, you couldn't return to the school. And that was disproportionately affecting kids with disabilities related to health, but also kids being pulled out to go to appointments um, for a variety of reasons. So it was really disproportionately borne by kids in that community. Um, I think what we did was we were interested in kind of studying, like funding something to understand how that policy was upended and changed to help inform like how to make policies more effective in other settings. Um, but it really did take a long time to really understand the impact of that, which was initially, we had um, ultimately negative consequences, but it was initially put in place as a pandemic related measure. So I think we're interested in also understanding how things like that, that were really health related preventive measures related to the pandemic might still be continuing to be used in schools and having potentially negative effects on kids and disproportionately negative effects on kids with disabilities. But it's just one example of kind of a- um, Well, and, it, and it's an interesting example of sometimes what we need to do is look at if policies well-intended actually have the opposite intent of what we want, as well as, I don't know if folks can find, um, I'm thinking that I've sometimes seen bright spot schools um, where <laughs> they have lower levels of chronic, or at least their kids with disabilities don't have any different kind of level of chronic absence than the regular kids. I definitely have seen sometimes, this was pre-pandemic, where it was those schools that really had an, um, a, a multiple, uh, they had multiple ways for kids to learn, a, a total approach to inclusion. And part of it was, I think that their kids with disabilities felt such a sense of connection and belonging in their schools that they wanted to show up every day. Um, so that's an example of what sometimes we've seen from Bright Spots. But any of you been able to look at this? I don't know if this has come up um, either in, in Arizona or uh, Memphis or Lehigh. We haven't looked specifically with, um, you know, students with special needs, but I think I think what, what this strikes me, though, is the earlier question you had, Hetty, about what funders can do and kind of bigger picture items is that I think there we are in need of some proof of concept um, work of looking at a community and whether it be special needs, whether it be on in the transportation area about what works and what is scalable versus what is at the local level. And, you know, maybe this is one of those opportunities where the big P policy really is at the state level. Um, um, as Megan mentioned, the White House is looking at absenteeism as well, is that there are a pot of resources to do these proof of concept or to do these unique focus areas in the communities about what the what needs are. Because I, I think we're not gonna, there's not a one size fits all and we're not gonna have a one size fits all um, funding source for this. So we have to be um, selective of how we're helping and that's where philanthropy can help. You know, if we show that we, if we have research that's showing that this work is helpful, then that will help pave the way for whether state policy, national, or even at the local level. So as we come to a close, I wanted to offer a chance for each one of you to say a minute or two statement about as you, so it either could be one thing you've done that you feel like made the most difference as a funder, or one thing you hope to do as a funder that you think will make the most difference as we move forward. So it could either be reflective or perspective, but what's one thing that you feel like coming from your position as a local state or national funder that you really think um, helps to make a difference on this issue? So I'm the newest to philanthropy. So, 
<laughs> no, I'm the newest to this space, so I'll go first. So very short. I think just from my perspective, what's been really helpful is just having a state, like saying we care about this issue in an explicit public way. And that to me has been really in like generating a lot of influence and engagement in the issue from others, even though we haven't made one, you know, an investment in chronic absenteeism research yet, we'll be doing so in the next two months. Um, but just really putting that on our website, putting that in our public statements that we care about this issue and we want to make a difference in it and use research to do so has been really, I think, um, important. And putting that publicly out has been um generating a lot of interest in this work from funders and policymakers and other folks that we're engaging with. Not to mention researchers, Megan, yes, because and researchers. they're starting to think really <laughs> creatively, what could or should I be doing to make a difference in this spot? Janice. Yeah, I, I, I am so thrilled that the uh, foundation really was a, ahead of the curve. I mean, the research that came out was really on the cusp of COVID-19 and the serendipity that ended up happening to have both the states that we were working in working together and really cross pollinating um, how to help each other out. And so I'm going to cheat. I mean, that's what I'm most excited about. But what I, the future wise, I think there is a huge policy play to make. I don't think we know specifically yet what that is, um, except for the fact that we need to be also, we need to be talking about the same thing. I think we say absenteeism. Some people think truancy. Some people think tardiness. Um, what are we talking about making sure we're measuring the same things because the solutions may be different if we have different definitions. And so that's, I'm excited about looking at that in the future. Thank you. Holly, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, well, I think one, one thing that'll be important for us as a foundation with our local partners is to just continue to shine a light on chronic absenteeism and the importance of it. Um, cause as I mentioned, it really came into, um, being something that we were all looking at when it was added to the accountability framework. And as happens with changes in administration, it has recently been removed from the accountability framework here in Tennessee after, you know, seven or eight years. And so we're, we're going to have to make sure that it's something that we continue to focus on and think about because it's really important whether it's part of the accountability framework or not. And another thing I just wanted to mention really quickly, because I know someone um, asked about funding in the chat and, you know, certainly funding is important and you want to have um, funding available for initiatives, but we also did see and learn that a lot of it does have to do with, I think Jill mentioned about school climate, about the relationships that schools build, and also just about data that's already available, but are you using the data correctly? Are you looking at it? Are you using it for strategies? And how are you, how are the roles in your school, um, you know, being, uh, properly designed so that this is something that your school collectively as a team can really look at. So there's definitely, um, you know, money helps, but there's also just some things around school climate, culture, um, systems, and, and, you know, design of your team that can really make an impact on chronic absenteeism as well. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, I think what I'm most proud of is that we were on the front end of helping to share the research and the awareness around what chronic absenteeism was. And I say that because we made such good progress pre-COVID and post-COVID, the schools that we had been working in were able to actually bounce back. They had some of the hugest gains in chronic absenteeism in the wrong way. But in a year's time, they've been able to make some of the some of the largest decreases back in the other direction. And I think it's because they had continuously been hearing, understanding chronic absenteeism, looking at data, had some of the infrastructure, had some of the partnerships. And so while they were hit the hardest, they've also rebounded. Um, and so we are playing that influencer role where we need to be doing better is at documenting some of the wins. We, we lift them up and we celebrate them in the short term, but doing more of the, the uh, research or the documentation of the steps that have been taken and the results that have been seen because of that is where, where we're headed and where we need to be doing more work. You know, Jill, um, we saw that similar happen and uh, we looked at data in California with another group uh, that the folks who had actually more infrastructure, they got really hard hit. And I think that is somewhat about the communities that you're working on when you're the highest poverty you would put in place. And then it just got overwhelmed 
But then this question of, do you have faster progress? And I think some of that progress really connects to what Holly, you were talking about. If you do it all as case management, you will stay overwhelmed because you can't, you, you have to have a tiered approach that has prevention oriented school climate engagement work happening. Otherwise doing it just one by one by every kid is too much for school infrastructure. And Jill, how we, how we both, and I think Megan, this is also the challenge. It's not just individual interventions. It's how do individual interventions come together in a system? Um, and the one thing I would say is that I think how we have funders work together, public and private, this is all hands on deck, but having a common understanding of the issue, as you said, Janet, but also have knowing, um, having a common understanding of what might work and where we can place bets together, I think is going to be really important for us um, taking a long-term approach and sustaining it. Thank you so much. You are all amazing. So impressive to hear the leadership of you and your foundations. And with that, I'm turning it back to Sarah. Thank you, Hetty. Um, quick plug before we close out um, for the day. Just wanted to make sure that if you haven't had a chance to yet, um, that you take just a quick second to fill out the survey poll that we launched a little while ago. Um, and then just huge thanks to all of our incredible panelists today, uh, to Holly Coleman, to uh, Janice Palmer, to Megan McCormick, to Jill Pereira for joining us to share what you are doing, where you're seeing progress, where you're still struggling, and some of the research plans that you have um, for kind of figuring out next steps. This is an ongoing challenge. We know that. We've been talking about it today, and it's important that we kind of have opportunities like this to learn from each other about the roles that philanthropy can play, as well as learn from future research as we dig into some of those root causes and effective solutions so that we're investing where we know we really get the best bang for our bucks. So thank you to you uh, to, to all of you for your leadership in this area. Um, and then huge thanks to our friend and partner, Hetty Chang, for helping us to plan this conversation and really to helping to light a fire about this issue long before um, we ever thought that a COVID would happen and really make it even more of a crisis. Um, I, and then thank you to all of you who joined us and engaged in the Q&A box and the chat box, sharing examples of what's working in your communities and opportunities and strategies that maybe we could all learn from and apply um, in our work. Bring up the slide really quickly if we can before we close. Just wanted to make sure you are all aware of some of our upcoming conversations. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat really quickly so that you can register for some of these sessions. Um, later this afternoon, actually, we'll have um, a session digging into how we can scale um, and uh, in increase access to effective high dosage tutoring. Um, next week, we're going to learn about another big bet that's working around ed tech learning how we can make sure that um, more kids have access to effective education technology tools to accelerate equitable learning recovery. And then uh, we will wrap up the month, April 30th, with a session looking at the uh, lawsuit in California um, and how it can inform action, not just in the state of California, but across the country as um, all education leaders and community partners work to ensure equitable um, learning recovery and make sure that equity is at the uh, root of all of our work. And then we'll kick off May with a session. It doesn't have the date or information there, but it's May 7th, uh, 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern time with another one of our Kindergarten Matters sessions, looking at um, how we can make sure that children are registered and have all of the um, uh, vaccinations and other supports that they need to be uh, start the school year um, successfully um, and attending school regularly. Um, hope you'll make plans to join us for all of those sessions. And again, huge thanks to our panel um, for their leadership and for joining us today. <laughs>